Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second lecture in Microsoft Research's series on race and technology. My name is Nancy Baim. I'm a researcher at MSR, and I'm really thrilled to be able to host this series. Um, we have speakers from multiple disciplines presenting groundbreaking scholarship at the intersection, at intersection excuse me, of race and technology. We're hoping that this series will demonstrate the range of ways that race and tech construct one another, and we hope that with such awareness, we might build a more just and equitable future. Some of you come to this series with deep expertise, and we hope that for you, the breadth of the topics we've put together will expose you to and spark new ideas. Others may be tuning into these ideas for the first time. Some of you will probably be excited to find language for ill-formed ideas you've had. Some of you might find yourself unsettled or even upset. The social construct of race is, of course, an uncomfortable topic that's hard to discuss. So whether you're new to the topic or familiar, comfortable or uneasy, I want to thank you for being here today to be part of this essential discussion. I'm going to be monitoring questions in the Q&A during uh, the talk, so feel free to put those in as we go along. Today we are fortunate to get to hear from Dr. Kim Tallbear. Dr. Tallbear is an associate professor in the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta, where she holds the first ever Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples, Technoscience and Environment. Her work there focuses on Indigenous peoples' engagements with science and technology as those fields and projects serve Indigenous self-determination. She's with us today because of her groundbreaking work on how genetic science shapes and is shaped by notions of race and indigeneity, a topic she developed most completely in her book, Native American DNA, Tribal Belonging and the False Promise of Genetic Science. Her talk today is titled, The Vanishing Indian Speaks Back, Race, Genomics, and Indigenous Rights. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kim Tallbear. Hi, uh, before I get started, I want to go over some terminology with you so you will understand why I move between different terms throughout this talk. And the main message of this is that uh, terminology for indigenous peoples, like for any other group, is geographically, temporally, and politically contextual. So what is considered politically or socially correct will change over time and place, and it will depend on who is speaking as to which terms are permissible to use. So you'll hear me use multiple terms throughout this talk to refer to indigenous peoples. And the first term is indigenous, obviously, and I'll get more into what that means throughout this talk. The second term is native, which is a term that we do tend to use in the US and Canada. It's not so common, say, in uh, Australia or New Zealand. Uh, in the US, Native American is probably the most common pan-native term, and it is the term that tends to get used in bureaucratic speak, say by tribal and federal agencies. In the 1970s and 1980s, the term American Indian was more common, and before the 1970s, back to the 17th, 18th century, just the term Indian. Now in Canada, uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people uh, that's the legal language used in Canada. Indian was also used in earlier decades, and we also sometimes use native up here. I am from the United States, but I've been living in Canada for five or six years. So you will see me going back and forth between uh, examples and terminology from the US and Canada, but there's a lot of shared terminology. So in Canada as well, sometimes Aboriginal is used, although it's being replaced in bureaucratic and popular speak by the term Indigenous. So even by federal agencies and in community, this is uh, a bit less common in the United States to use the term Indigenous. And finally, we all use people-specific terms. So for example, you might hear me mention the Cherokee or the Ocheti Shakawin, which is my people, which is Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota. Uh, those were the people that were involved at the Standing Rock uh, pipeline protests in 2016. You might hear me mention Nez Perce, Yakima, Cree, Métis, etc. So all of these people-specific terms and these peoples or nations get grouped together under the umbrella Indigenous. So I want to talk a little bit now about uh, the racist origins of the idea and narrative of the vanishing Indian. Phil Deloria, who is from a well-known Dakota family and a professor of history at Harvard uh, these days, provides a concise account of how we ended up with the national myth of the vanishing Indian. And you can read along on this slide as I read a passage from his 1998 book, Playing Indian. <laughs> 
It's a really interesting read if you get a chance to read the whole book. It's not a dry, boring academic book at all. So you can read along. President Andrew Jackson forced the Cherokees to take the Trail of Tears. Americans waged war, signed treaties, and used guile and force to relocate hundreds of thousands of Indian people. By the middle of the 19th century, most Native people had indeed been made to disappear from the Eastern landscape. In conjunction with Indian removal, popular American imagery began to play on earlier symbolic linkages between Indians and the past, and these images eventually produced the full-blown ideology of the vanishing Indian, which proclaimed it foreordained that less advanced societies should disappear in the presence of those more advanced. Propagandists shifted the cause and effect of Indian disappearance from Jacksonian policy to Indians themselves, who were simply living out their destiny. By law of nature, claimed the Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story in 1828, they seem destined to a slow but sure extinction. Now, the idea that indigenous peoples are destined to vanish is, as you can see from this quote, by now a 200-year-old cherished national myth. The red race was expected to fade away, leaving empty land for inevitable occupation and development by white civilization. The classic image of the vanishing American, one example was on the title slide to this talk, illustrates this myth. It graced early 20th century novels and movie advertisements, including a film by the same name. In these images, often also sold as melodramatic posters in the 1970s, I can attest to that, I was there, <laughs> a stereotypical 19th century Plains Indian sits on horseback, facing west into the sun that sets on his epic. These images were sometimes also entitled End of the Trail. In the example on the title slide, the Indian's otherwise copper-colored body fades to white, or disappears, which are essentially the same outcome. After the Indian Wars ended in the late 19th century, white society assumed the Indian would finally die out. Politicians tried to hurry things along by mechanisms other than the massacres and epidemics that had occurred in earlier centuries. As the reservation era began in the late 19th and early 20th century, both U.S. and Canadian governments forcibly removed Native children to residential schools for cultural and religious assimilation. They sometimes placed Native children with white families, and they continue to. In the mid-20th century, the U.S. implemented urban relocation programs designed to transfer Native people to urban areas for job and uh, other economic opportunities. The federal government in the U.S. also legally terminated, i.e. took away governmental status from some tribes in order to get hold of the land. All of these policies and programs were trying to, quote, kill the Indian and save the man, a common 19th century slogan. The racial thinking of the day was that the Indian could be whitened and assimilated, the U.S. and Canada, therefore, also sought to define the Indian out of existence when they imposed the racial idea of Indian blood quantum. Unlike the one-drop rule that was applied to, say, black people, wherein any known African ancestry would classify a person as black, Native people in the U.S. and Canada were subjected to a different racial classification system. In that system, one must be at least one half or more Indian blood to count as Indian for the purposes of various laws and regulations. If one's blood quantum was, say, one quarter, which would mean perhaps three white grandparents and one native grandparent, that person was seen as able to be assimilated and civilized and could, for example, hold title to land instead of having it held in trust. These kinds of racial ideas continue to shape American thought, including the genome sciences, although I am sure that scientists in general have no clue that they, like the public, read from a several hundred year old racial script when it comes to their thinking about indigenous peoples. So now let's spend a few minutes learning about how indigenous peoples tend to think about themselves or ourselves, which is as peoples or nations and not as a disappearing race 
beneath the turning wheels of U.S. or Canadian civilization. You need to understand Indigenous peoples' own definitions in order to understand where the scientific definitions go so wrong. Contrary to the vanishing Indian stereotype, the number of people defined as Indigenous worldwide is actually growing. Worldwide estimates today range from 250 to 600 million individuals belonging to over 4,000 Indigenous groups. And in the U.S., we have among the highest birth rates of any ethnic or racially categorized group. There were tremendous population drops in numbers of Indigenous people since contact in the 15th century throughout the end of the 19th century due to often genocidal acts of colonial powers. But especially since the mid 20th century, at least in the US, indigenous population numbers have been rebounding according to our own definitions, if not the definitions of geneticists, which I'll get to shortly. Let's look at indigenous people's definitions as laid out on this slide and which I have grouped within the largest circle as social movement and political discourse. And I characterize that social movement and political discourse that Indigenous peoples use about ourselves as explicitly political, meaning we know we're talking politics, we know we're talking social dynamics and culture, and in ways especially that challenge the assimilative nation state. So I've talked a lot about how the, the US and Canada attempt to assimilate Indigenous peoples, so I call them the assimilative state. So grouped within that social movement and political discourse are four sorts of characteristics that I think you'll see talked about throughout this talk that we use to define ourselves as Indigenous. And I've gone through a lot of different scholarly literature as well as having done my own field work to come up with these uh, different groupings in these other circles. So the first is we tend to think of ourselves in terms of our historical continuity with pre-colonial societies and ancestral territories. So we're thinking about ourselves, right, as descended from our ancestors, both our biological ancestors, but also our ancestors that had really particular relationships with certain land and waterscapes. So those traditional territories matter a lot in terms of how we think about our peoplehood. We're not only these biological organisms. We're not only humans. We have deeply held relationships with non-humans, land and water that help shape us as who we are today and in antiquity. The second idea that we use, and this is shared with genome scientists and other members of the public, is that we think of ourselves as in many ways culturally distinct from settler societies. Now, that distinct is a little bit of a blurry line, but just you get the general idea. The third characteristic that we tend to think about is our determination as Indigenous Peoples, capital P, to persist as culturally and nationally distinct entities. So we have a lot of language wherein we talk about ourselves as nations. We also think about ourselves, and this is also shared with dominant society, as usually being economically and culturally non-dominant. We're minorities. We tend to be disproportionately poor. Okay, those are sort of the four characteristics we're thinking about. So in summary, Indigenous peoples understand themselves or ourselves to have emerged as coherent groups and cultures in intimate relationship with particular places, with living landscapes that are co-constituted with our cultures over hundreds of years, if not millennia. And I spoke to co-constitution already. That's the idea of the land shaping us and us shaping the land. There's not a one-way relationship there. So therefore, an Indigenous group, say like my people, the Dakota, do not simply share specific genetic ancestry evidenced in a population, that's a genetic term, but we are a people that is at once largely biologically related and also organized as a political entity, plus simultaneously co-constituted in those dynamic, long-standing relationships with living landscapes. One scholar notes that indigeneity as an umbrella concept may be thought of as the strongest focus for resistance to imperial control in colonial societies. Again, explicitly political. You can see that focus on indigenous social movement, resistance and political discourse on this slide. Many indigenous people from all over North America and the world, in addition to our allies, came together at the Standing Rock Indian Reservation in 2016. Many of you will have seen news coverage of that. 
That reservation straddles the North and South Dakota borders in the U.S. They came together to protest the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. The photo on the right of the women dancing is one from the Idle No More actions, probably in 2012. Idle No More is an ongoing social movement founded in Saskatoon in 2012, that's a city in Canada, by four women, three Indigenous and one non-Indigenous ally. Idle No More connected a parliamentary bill attacking environmental protections to violations of Indigenous land and treaty rights in Canada. The Idle No More vision for their movement focused on Indigenous ways of knowing rooted in Indigenous sovereignty to protect water, air, land, and creation for all future generations. It organized peaceful round dances in public spaces and blockades of rail lines and highways to bring attention to fossil fuel and other industry injustices and infringements on Indigenous land rights. Indigenous peoples recognition that our lives and treaty rights are also dependent upon the well-being of the water and land sparked both Idle No More and Standing Rock or the No Dapple movement into being. These Indigenous environmental and social movements say that they seek respect of Indigenous land rights not only for Indigenous people's well-being, but for the well-being of everyone and for the planet. So these are definitions of indigeneity that are focused on living and thriving, not vanishing. When genetic knowledge moves to the center of the picture, the definition of indigenous gets rearticulated in a way that flattens understanding of us to ancestry. This is what I call genomic indigeneity. And that focuses on biological descent and relations between populations across time and space. Within that definition, indigenous becomes a biological or population-based category. And I'll say more about that on the next slide. But before we get to the details, a key point is that what unites Indigenous peoples globally from a genomic perspective is not opposition to colonialism or autochthonous, which means specific land-based cosmologies, but rather what unites us from a genomic perspective is genetic descent from a founder population on a particular continent or multiple founder populations on particular continents. Biogeographic notions of indigeneity evoke older and persisting ideas of race that are grounded in the expectation of inevitable disappearance. On this slide is a description of indigeneity by a former PI for the Genographic Project or a principal investigator. Genographic was launched in 2005 with the goal of gathering 100,000 indigenous samples from around the world for study of human migration history and you can read along. And this is uh, Spencer Wells, the PI for the Genographic Project, uh, speaking. This is a quote from the Genographic website back uh, around 2007 when I was actively studying this organization. He said, We can see living evidence of an ancient African trek through India to populate even isolated Australia. But to fully complete the picture, we must gradually, or I'm sorry, we must greatly expand the pool of genetic samples. Time is short. In a shrinking world, mixing populations are scrambling genetic signals. The key to this puzzle is acquiring genetic samples from the world's remaining indigenous and traditional peoples whose ethnic and genetic identities are isolated. But such distinct peoples, languages and cultures are quickly vanishing into a 21st century global melting pot. Notice too how Wells discusses indigenous and traditional peoples as isolated, thereby ignoring, probably not intentionally, the realities of how indigenous peoples have been treated by colonial powers, removed from our lands, mixed together in residential and boarding schools, relocated to cities, and had our children forcibly removed. Genomic articulations, like Indigenous peoples' own definitions, do recognize Indigenous difference from invading states, but then turn to focus on less genetically admixed populations presumed to be culturally and biologically distinct. This 
despite the centuries-long project of settler colonial nation-states to promote native mixing with white society, to become whitened, and along with our legal and moral claims to the land, disappear. And I should say, as an aside, that they got to the point of the genetic mixing after the era of the Indian Wars and the massacres and the separation of Indigenous people. So federal policy in the U.S. and Canada has gone back and forth between extermination and assimilation. It's a fascinating history. So you should begin to understand that genomic ideas about Indigenous peoples are just as political or cultural, a thought process as are Indigenous peoples' own definitions. And let's go through those details on that slide. Whereas Indigenous peoples' own discourses about indigeneity are explicitly political, I argue that genomic discourse is implicitly political, meaning it's just as political, but they're not so aware that they are enacting very political, social, and cultural ideas. It's more kind of underneath the surface. It's a bit more insidious. So genomic discourse assumes and is supported by the assimilative state. It assumes that vanishing, that notion of vanishing supports the way that it samples and talks about indigenous peoples. The first characteristic of that genomic discourse is not too dissimilar from what's partly the same as the way indigenous peoples talk about it and partly different. They also focus on autochthony, meaning originating where found. So they'll focus on indigenous people's rootedness in particular land and waterscapes. But whereas indigenous people take that rootedness and go out into the world and try to be dynamic, thriving, and survive colonization, genomic uh, fields tend to think about autochthony as implying stasis. Indigenous peoples should be isolated, unchanged, more traditional than not. Uh, not admixed, because this uh, means that they are better people to sample for genome research. The second characteristic that genome scientists focus on is historical continuity with pre-contact societies, uh, just as we do, but again with an eye towards stasis, not toward dynamism. The third characteristic, again, is cultural biological distinctiveness, which I've already outlined. They also focus, like we do, on indigenous people's non-dominance in the broader society. But whereas we sort of catapult from that non-dominance to make political claims about survival and thriving to improve our lives, they take that non-dominance to mean an inevitable sort of sense of scarcity and impending death of indigenous people. So while genomic definitions seem to share some common points with indigenous definitions, let me emphasize how indigeneity actually gets tied really strongly to genetics in these definitions. Number one, scientists worry about indigenous peoples vanishing because they view them as storehouses of unique genetic diversity. And the more admix they are, the less unique they are, the less useful they are for research into human population history. That's legitimate, right, as a goal, um, but you can also see where it inevitably shores up old school racial ideas. Second, since the genetic signatures of founding populations are confounded in those who are more highly admixed, those people are just less useful for research. Third, the admixed native becomes not indigenous enough. This is illustrated by common sampling standards wherein a good research subject should have three or four indigenous grandparents, as I already said, not one. The ideal in genetic studies of human evolution is to sample individuals with four grandparents from the same population. Renowned population geneticist Luca Cavalli Sforza wrote in 1994 that aboriginal populations with 25% or more admixture were excluded from his global study. Smaller scale studies are even stricter, ranging from 0% alleged admixture in individuals, i.e. meaning they should have four, indigenous, or four endogenous grandparents, to population admixture rates of less than 5%, 8.7%, and 12% from studies conducted uh, in the late 1970s through to the 1990s. Admixture is calculated according to the presence in populations of haplotypes or genetic lineages that are tied to non-American geographies. So say to populations who uh, came to the Americas from Europe, Asia, or Africa. Finally, 
if admixture is on the rise, indigenous people are, by genetic definition, vanishing. Yet, the same admixed individuals will simultaneously be considered as legitimate members when the indigenous group's own citizenship rules and kinship norms are applied. Indigeneity recast as genetic becomes again a discourse of scarcity and death rather than what it is for indigenous peoples, which is a discourse of survival. Let's look at a case in which uh, the vanishing Indian narrative comes into play in ways that challenge indigenous governance and cultural uh, rights in relatively contemporary times. In 1996, a Washington State college student stumbled upon one of the most complete ancient skeletons ever discovered at the edge of the Columbia River in Washington State. By June 2015, it was announced that the 9,000-year-old so-called Kennewick Man most closely was related to today's Native Americans, including the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation in Washington State. To the tribes in Washington, the announcement of their kinship to what they called the Ancient One came as no surprise, but it was a long road to get to that official announcement. Since the remains were discovered in 1996, the Confederated Tribes of the Colville, Umatilla, and others claimed the Ancient One as their ancestor. They argued from the beginning that the remains should be returned to them in accordance with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA. However, vocal scientists who were really interested in those remains protested the tribe's claims. They argued that despite the antiquity of the remains, there wasn't sufficient evidence to link the Ancient One or Kennewick Man to living tribes. Early morphological and genetic examinations on the remains were inconclusive as to which specific Native American tribes the remains could be historically affiliated with. And in 2004, a judge ruled that the Ancient One failed NAGPRA's cultural affiliation requirement that a shared group identity must be traced from the skeleton to present day members of the tribe who were claiming the remains through geography, kinship, folklore, and more if that skeleton is actually to be given back to tribes for reburial, which is usually what they want to do when they claim ancient remains under NAGPRA with the idea that those remains were actually disturbed when they were unearthed. Now, it's difficult enough to prove cultural affiliation with a 9,000-year-old skeleton. Some might think that providing a genetic link, if technical conditions are right, is a more straightforward and less political approach. But proving genetic affiliation is also both technically and politically complicated. Still, the Department of Interior that governs NAGPRA determined that cultural affiliation was indeed satisfied by a preponderance of evidence. That is, by the fact that the remains were found uh, in the location that they were, which was within a certain indigenous group's traditional territory, as documented by tribal oral tradition, of their long occupation in that region, but still the legal back and forth continued. A group of scientists challenged DOIs, the Department of Interior's ruling in court, in 2004, the court again confirmed the material, cultural, and historical evidence as inadequate to support a finding that Kennewick Man, or the Ancient One, was related to any particular identifiable group or culture. Now, definitions of cultural affiliation that draw on genetic lineal descent, oral tradition, and contemporary tribal citizenship can be highly divergent. They may overlap, but they are never pinned perfectly to one another like fabric to a pattern. We are therefore certain to be confronted again and again with conflicts over remains and claims to historical truth, just as morphological examination offers at best imprecise indications of cultural affiliation Genetic evidence due to population bottlenecks rendered by colonial diseases and extermination and the fact that most ancient remains, uh, or most ancient humans whose remains are found do not have direct descendants living today. These conditions will often not result in determination of a direct biological relationship of ancient remains to living, unambiguous Native Americans in the same geographical vicinity. Uh, vicinity.
genome evidence is likely to further complicate an already complex legal, historical, and cultural field, is my point. And Indigenous advocates are concerned that genomic definitions of relatedness that inform decisions about cultural affiliation will prevail over Indigenous definitions and knowledge claims because genome science is held to have greater truth power. The Ancient One's DNA was finally sequenced in the lab of ancient DNA es expert Eska Willerslev. In 2014, his team also published the first full sequence of an ancient Native American genome based on the 12,000-year-old remains of a small child unearthed on the property of Montana's Anzic family. By comparing the genomes of what they called the Anzic child and Kennewick man, the team showed that both persons were descended from the same ancestral population. When they compared the ancient genomes of those with contemporary Native Americans, Willerslev's lab found that Kennewick man is more closely affiliated with contemporary tribes in the Pacific Northwest, including the Colville, while Anzic Child was more closely related with present-day indigenous groups in Central and South America. Willerslev's lab got favorable press for approaching Native American tribes and asking for their participation in the study. This included asking them to provide biological samples for comparison, although only the Colville tribe agreed to that part to provide samples from their own living people. For some indigenous peoples, these requests from scientists to provide their own samples present a conundrum. If more tribes agree to participate and give biological samples, then more local DNA will be available for comparison. And Kennewick man's relationship, for example, to specific North American tribes might be clarified. But some indigenous peoples are still hesitant to participate given their centuries of mistreatment by scientific fields. Thus, my question again is, whose interests are served by research on Native American bodies? European and American scientists have been violating Native American graves for hundreds of years. In centuries past, scientists actually paid grave robbers to boil down stolen bones and to send them to American universities for examination and sometimes for public display. Indigenous peoples continue to battle globally with museums and universities to return their remains after that kind of history of exploitation. So as you can see on the slide, in September 2016, U.S. Congress passed legislation to return the Ancient One to a coalition of tribes, and the remains were buried in February 2017 at an undisclosed location. All of this hinging, however, on genetic knowledges and definitions. Let's look at a second case that risks supplanting Indigenous people's own political, social, and land-based definitions of Indigenous peoplehood and kinship with genetic definitions. During the early to mid-2000s, Native American tribes in the U.S. and First Nations in Canada have adopted DNA testing. But tribes and First Nations do not seek to pinpoint the same continental genetic ancestry that human genome diversity researchers search for in their research subjects. North American indigenous governmental entities are not interested, for example, in mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosome markers that trace from those founder populations in the Americas. Those are among the types of DNA tests commonly sold online by companies like 23andMe to the general public, including to El uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren back in uh, 2018. Some of you will remember when she took a DNA test to try to shore up her claims that she was descended from Cherokee people. In blood samples from an individual and one or both of that person's biological parents, the DNA profile examines repeated sequences of nucleotides called short tandem repeats or STRs, which are inherited from both parents. And these are the kinds of DNA tests that indigenous governments in the U.S. and Canada are using uh, in the course of tribal citizenship or band membership. Uh, these tests are more commonly known simply as parentage tests, and they are used to prove that a potential tribal or First Nation citizen is the biological offspring of a person on their citizenship roles. So a different kind of DNA test than, say, the 23andMe genetic ancestry test, right? So a single such sequence, the uh, short tandem repeats used in the DNA profile or the parentage test, 
Uh, these uh, sequences are not unique when you take just one sequence, one short tandem repeat. But when you view them in combination with many short tandem repeat or, SP or STRs, an individual's total STR pattern becomes increasingly distinctive or in practical terms unique. This is the same form of DNA analysis commonly used in criminal cases to prove, for example, that a strand of hair or skin cells found at a crime scene belongs to a victim or an individual suspect. Okay, so why do tribes and First Nations sometimes use parentage tests? To help demonstrate in cases where it is in question, uh, a citizenship or tribal enrollment applicant's biological descent from an enrolled tribal member. While enrollment into a tribe by marriage or adoption was allowed in many U.S. tribes through the mid-20th century, meaning you didn't have to be biologically related, today, almost without exception, tribal citizens must be biologically descended from enroll already enrolled tribal members, from close biological family members. And there's a fascinating story about these changes in tribal citizenship in the 20th, 20th century, but I can't get into that in our limited time. But suffice it to say, DNA testing on a case-by-case -case basis, when parentage is in doubt, is now a widespread practice in tribal communities. Some tribes, including my own, the Sisseton, Wapaton, Oyate in South Dakota, will now accept a signed affidavit from several relatives claiming an individual as, as their child, their niece, their nephew, or their grandchild in lieu of a DNA test. Other tribes require across the membership DNA testing and sometimes even require retroactive DNA testing of already enrolled members. Now one can imagine the social and familial troubles that will result when false biological parentage is uncovered, a not infrequent occurrence in any population. Members might be then disenrolled, their present and future descendants might not be eligible for enrollment or citizenship based on those DNA findings. They might then not be eligible for all of the associated program and financial benefits that come with citizenship. Families can be torn apart when you do across the membership DNA testing in tribes and First Nations. The most rigid DNA rules and controversial disenrollments or taking citizenship away tend to occur in a small minority of very small, wealthy gaming tribes with highly profitable casinos near to urban areas. So we've heard about some high profile disenrollments, say in some very small tribes uh, near LA who have casinos. The monthly payouts of per capita payments to individual members in such tribes can range into the tens of thousands of dollars. The returns to individuals are kept high if numbers of enrolled citizens are kept low, motivating the move to rigid DNA testing requirements in these communities. Now again, this is a very small number of tribal communities. Most tribes don't do these kinds of things. But DNA testing for enrollment is having an insidious effect on our thinking about who is a tribal member and who is indigenous. Unlike other contentious tribal citizenship rules, such as blood quantum, which I described earlier, DNA testing has the advantage of claims to scientific precision and objectivity. One DNA testing company spokesperson whom I interviewed noted that in using a DNA profile analysis for tribal enrollment, there is, quote, no possibility of incorporating a subjective decision into whether someone becomes a member or not. Unquote. Yet, whether or not someone is verifiable biological kin of the type indicated by a parentage test is not an objective enrollment criterion. Allowing a DNA profile to trump other ways of reckoning kin prioritizes technological and scientific knowledge of certain relationships over other types of knowledge about those relationships. That is a social and political decision. That is a value-laden position. Using DNA tests on a case-by-case -case basis, i.e. when biological parentage of one individual is in doubt, is one thing. Although other means of documenting kinship, such as the affidavit I mentioned, are also available. But the increasing tribal and First Nation practice of DNA testing across the entire membership 
risks re-racializing Native Americans or First Nations by promoting the idea that the indigenous community is a genetic population. Despite their significant technical differences, many tribal members or First Nation citizens will not distinguish between STR testing of relatedness between specific people from the DNA analysis used in human genome diversity research that is interested in research populations on particular continents of origin. In addition, if continental genetic ancestry analyses come to be coupled with the DNA profile, say you use both tests together, this could result in some real uh, kind of conceptual problems for indigenous communities. I went to a tribal enrollment conference held by this national nonprofit for tr uh, tribal enrollment bureaucratic staff uh, back in 2003. And they were talking about uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA tests, the genetic ancestry tests, being occasionally used to ascertain maternal lineages in tribal enrollment cases. I worry about cases like that because they say to me that race is certain to loom larger in our conceptions of Native American tribal and First Nations identity in the U.S. and Canada in the future. So all of this presents cause for worry. For a too heavy focus on genetics risks undercutting the legal foundations of Indigenous governance. For example, treaties between the U.S. and Canada and Indigenous peoples in both countries and case law articulate what we call nation-to-nation -nation relationships between both of these nation states and indigenous peoples. These treaties and laws, while colonial and laden with problems, are still critical for contemporary indigenous peoples and their governmental authorities, including the right to determine who our own citizens are. Genetic articulations of indigenous history and identity, and also public understandings, operate without reference to these legal histories. It is race, and population, respectively, that matter in the minds of the scientists and of the public, not Indigenous political authorities and citizenship. If Indigenous peoples ourselves begin to embrace too much genetic definitions and measures, we help undermine our own political authorities. We aid the ascendancy of genetics as legitimate grounds for Indigenous citizenship claims in ways that may rival or overtake the existing historical legal foundations of Indigenous governance and citizenship. This is what is at stake in genetic articulations of indigeneity. Decisions to use genomics within Indigenous communities to decide who belongs to our communities are non-neutral. They are highly political acts while simultaneously being science-based governance decisions. Sound science and politics are not mutually exclusive. We may decide that genetics matters in conferring tribal identity and attendant legal rights, but we cannot rest in the idea that this is a neutral or so-called objective decision. Privileging genomics in the designation of a citizen and in broader identity and kinship constructions is a value decision about which facts matter and which do not. Do we value genetic kin and citizenship versus kin and citizens made through law, ceremony, or love? Or do we value these kinship forms in combination? And in which circumstances? We in Indigenous communities do science and we use science within and not despite our histories and politics. We will be aided in using science well if scientific and technical fields that develop technologies for our use take account of these histories and grapple more knowingly and explicitly with the politics of those histories. You cannot develop scientific knowledges and technologies for communities without understanding the social and political worlds you drop those technologies into. Thanks, and you can read uh, my acknowledgments for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. That was that was really wonderful. Um, if you're listening, you're welcome to put questions in the in the Q and A column there, and I'll be happy to uh, moderate. Uh, we had one question.
uh, somewhat early in the talk where somebody was asking about sort of a psychology question of sort about whether, um, let me find it, scroll up, sorry. Uh, one question about whether the ideology that a culture's destiny should make room for a more, quote, civilized culture. Is this part of, is this piece of colonialism maybe a psychological attempt to otherize the persecuted culture to make it easier to do? So that if you see, I guess what this person is asking is if you see indigenous peoples as other, it's easier to imagine that civilizing them and making them vanish is acceptable. What Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I don't um, I don't use psychology or psychoanalysis in my work, right? I do discourse analysis and I read the archives. I, it is a question that I myself have um, and it's I'd have to do research in, in other disciplines to, to, to use psychological terminology. I do sometimes talk about, um, and I'm using this more as a lay person, about the nationalist delusion of the vanishing Indian. So I definitely, in that Phil Deloria book, Playing Indian, that I cited early on, because he's a historian, goes back and looks at the historical record in terms of the persistence of the vanishing Indian, but that's looking at the archival record. And so when we, when I talk about this being kind of a national delusion, I'm kind of speaking as a lay person. I'm not using, using delusion as a technical term. And I do wonder sometimes, um, you know, what somebody coming out of uh, psychology fields would have to say about, about the evidence, right? Um, but it is very, it's pervasive. The acceptance of this idea is pervasive um, in both technical and lay, lay fields. So yeah, one wonders. <laughs> can I, can, can, I, I, I'm wondering, I know that in, in many cases, people internalize these stereotypes about themselves. And I'm wondering, is that, is that a challenge in the indigenous communities, the internalization of an idea that they're, you're supposed to have vanished by now or, or, you know, that's a good question. Um, I I would say no, but I'd be interested in you know bringing that to other indigenous people. I mean, I grew up in a both in urban native areas uh, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and also on the reservation in South Dakota. So I come from you know a diverse yet typical kind of native background. But but I'm a professor, right? And I've been a professor for a while, and I've been a high, you know, highly educated professional for a while. So maybe I'm out of touch now. But I don't remember growing up that that people felt that way. Certainly, we feel under political and economic assault. You know, we we have felt under racist assault. But uh, I don't recall ever um, anybody in my community saying believing the the sort of nationalist white uh, story that that were vanishing. I feel like I grew up in a community that always pushed back against that. But I would be interested to hear from, say, younger people now coming from either urban or reservation native communities, how they feel. Yeah, yeah. Um, somebody has uh, asked in the chat, it can be assumed that the vanish vanishing in Vanishing indigenous has perpetuated in tech landscapes such as in technologies like internet search and so on. Um, and this person is wondering if you're observing any examples or seeds of changes in tech that seem to be leading toward more inclusion or less le reversing historical atrocities. Is there any light on the horizon? Do you see any positive progress in these issues? Well, people in your audience may know, I mean, I, I'm aware, I don't work in this area, but there are uh, indigenous people that are working on like language recovery apps and language revitalization apps. And we have a huge focus on language revitalization in Indian country, as we call it, which is, um, might sound politically incorrect, but it's a term that we use. It's a land tenure term. Um, and so there's a lot, you know, language revitalization is key. Uh, in our communities, and it's been really um, on the upswing since the early 1980s, which is just after the air, you know, about the time I'm leaving school, so I didn't benefit as much. But with that comes like all the language apps and things like that. So that to me is really um, a, a step in the right direction. Um, but yeah, you'd have to talk to engineers about other things <laughs> that are going. Um, and then I'm thinking about the data sovereignty. I had a small visual. In fact, there was a New York Times article, which I, I can't bring up quickly, but it just came out yesterday on an indigenous data sovereignty workshop that happened this week. 
Um, and so there are, and, and this is uh, indigenous genome scientists I know and people working in affiliated fields that have, that are, you know, young assistant professors, uh, postdocs, they're just coming out of school and they're, as they're doing their science, they're also thinking a lot about who governs the data because there is this move towards open data especially in the United States, but but tribes and indigenous peoples for reasons I've talked about are kind of protective of their data. So they're not automatically assuming that they want to share all their data openly. And so there is an active conversation going on with indigenous scientists and and uh, say biostaticians kind of pushing back against that and saying, look, we need to be meaningfully involved in this conversation. So there there's a lot happening now that when I started researching this 20 years ago was not the case. And it's particularly because we're training indigenous scientists who are focused on doing science uh, in a way that is supporting rather than uh, undermining uh, tribal governance or indigenous governance. So we ha we're, we're you know, training these politicized scientists, right, who are doing their science and engineering, but they're also really cognizant that there's no such thing as neutral objective science that isn't being produced within a political uh, society, right? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if you might take a step back for just a minute. You mentioned interviews and archives. I wonder if you might um, step back a minute and 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 give us a little briefing on on your your broader perspective as a STS anthropological sort of a person. What are your methods and what is sort of your general approach to this to this field more broadly? That's a huge question, I know, but I'm imagining engineers and folks like that watching who who may just be really unfamiliar with the kind of background that you bring to these questions. Yeah, you know, it is a good question. So I started out when I was writing my dissertation, which became the book Native American D DNA, Tribal Belonging and the False Promise of Genetic Science. I started out going to say American Society for Human Genetics. I went to the American Society of Physical Anthropology meetings uh, and, and you know, went in with a very critical eye because I was looking at the way that these old school race ideas were coloring the way people were working and sampling and talking about native research subjects, right? But as I, as I hung out more and more with scientists, I met critical scientists. And uh, that often, in, there's a lot to say here, <laughs> that mm -hmm. often turned out to be women who identified as feminists, queer scientists, crip scientists, to use the critical disability studies literature, uh, black scientists, other people of color, uh, other communities that had felt marginalized and like their bodies and communities and histories were the object of the scientific gaze. I mean, it's not only indigenous people that have been portrayed as uncivilized, deviant, backwards, and in need of civilizational redemption, right? So I found common cause with other people. Um, and then I tended to we tended to get invested in each other's projects. And so that then blossomed into, in part, the founding of the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics, or SING. And that was originally founded by non-Indigenous scientists, but people who kind of had that critical perspective. Uh, and then indigenous people working on the ethics and social stuff like I like I do. And then uh, 10 years later in the United States, we've got uh, indigenous scientists who have finished their PhDs who have now taken over the leadership of that organization. So I went from being an anthropologist of scientists who made scientists my laboratory mice <laughs> into teaming up with the critical ones and starting to do training and education in a way where I could be invested in a new kind of science. So I've moved from not only criticizing what I perceive as bad science, but to helping produce better science. And I sort of go back and forth between that. And just one final thing, what has enabled me to do that is uh, our feminist science studies scholars who really critique this notion of objectivity that we can stand at a distance from our research. Nobody uses some kind of random hypothesis generator, at least not that I know of. We all come to the questions we have in science because they occur as interesting to us and what in us in our background is making those questions interesting right um and so yeah i've really been helped by feminist scholarship as well as indigenous queer black people scholarship to think about these issues critically and also productively i love that and it, it speaks also to the point of the series which is to try to cast a really broad net on these questions because there is resonance among so many different areas um i'll mention uh, later in this series, we're going to be hearing from a couple of genetic scientists who will 
I think are are examples of folks who are bringing some of that critical edge that you're that you're talking about. Um, we have a question from Sharon Gillette, who I work with. Hi, Sharon, who is asking. Thank you for such a clear and informative talk and asks um, if there are good examples that you would suggest people look at for researchers who have incorporated this kind of historic and cultural understa understanding into their scientific work. Are there any role models that you might point others to toward who are trying to do this more yeah. thoughtfully? So one of the founders of Sing uh, is Ripon, R-I-P-A-N, Molly, M-A-L-H-I, and Ripon is in both uh, anthropology and the uh, Genome Center, uh, the Institute for Genomic Biology at the University of Illinois. Um, he works collaboratively with Indigenous communities. There's also a, a former student of mine and also a student of Deborah Bolnick in the Bolnick lab moved from Texas to Connecticut. Deborah Bolnick is one of the people I met when we were both in graduate school who has worked in more critical ways with Indigenous communities. And our former student, Rick W.A. Smith, is now at George Mason and Rick is not only bringing in, and he's non-Indigenous. Um, Deborah Bolnick had, I think I could talk about this. She had a bunch of Texans who came when we were both at Texas in her ancient DNA lab and they started informally calling themselves the Redneck Ancient DNA Lab. And they were a bunch of white Texans who were really critical, right? They, they, they come from economically marginalized backgrounds. They were first generation university students. They're not people meant to be in science either. And Rick was in that lab and he also brings queer bisexual kind of theoretical stuff to bear on science so he really questions heteronormative impositions in science as well as benefiting from uh, the kind of indigenous perspectives that I have and anti-racist perspectives of other scholars. Um, there is Shea Akeel um, McLean who's also a recent graduate of University of Illinois. I need to uh, you can go to my indigenoussts.com website and some of these people are on there as affiliates, people who are working, helping mentor our students now. There's so many more I could name. Uh, I'll have to make a list. <laughs> all right, well, that's great. I always go blank in those moments and you had it right on top of your head. Yeah, and many of them are young, right? And just starting to publish and, yeah. but, but yeah. And I should say Jonathan Marks as well as kind of a grandfather in the, um, uh, Jonathan Marks is, I think it one of the, one of the UNCs is a very kind of, physical anthropologist turned uh, historian of science who is kind of um, uh, controversial in many ways. He's very frank. But anyway, he's kind of also in this, this lineage. There's so, yeah, we yeah. have our intellectual lineages. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Um, I wanted to also mention she's she is not a critical scientist, but you mentioned data sovereignty, and I wanted to mention Desi Small Rodriguez, who is uh, somebody leading one of these indigenous data sovereignty centers. Um, at the UCLA US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network. So if, if there's anybody listening who's interested in data sovereignty questions, she's awesome. So that's yeah, one Desi example of that. And uh, Nani Bagarison is a Diné or Navajo scientist who retrained as a bioethicist who's also at UCLA and they're, I, they changed their Center for Society and Genetics. But yeah, so Desi and Nani Bar are both at, L, at UCLA. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a different world now. It's great. We've got these indigenous people doing this work that were not there in the same way 10 years ago. It's exciting. It's exciting. Um, I wanted to wrap up. We have a we have, I think, a good closing question here, which is uh, how can non-native folks help support this community? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> um, that's really good. I mean, uh, well, obviously donating to the cause in any way possible. I'm trying to, wow, I should have come prepared for that question. I don't know if you have <laughs> fancy. <laughs> um, well, I think, I mean, I think within Microsoft, there are, as we work on AI, there are things like the Indigenous and AI organization, which, which I think brings many of these kinds of issues into certainly our work on AI. We have it um, internally, we have an employee resource group, but I think that in general, certainly advocating for different kinds of causes like the ones that you've mentioned is important, but I, I take to heart your message that we really need to, if we're going to engage with technological issues that in any way impact indigenous peoples, we need to work with indigenous peoples to understand the points of views that you bring and the cultural understandings that you have about indigeneity before we do anything at all. Is that 
there? Yeah, and I, I also I think we're understanding that we do governance, right? Uh, and governance, uh, it's always political and really coming to terms within science and technology fields that nobody gets to operate outside of the political messiness of our society. I mean, you know, we we have certain we have peer review and we have other methods that we bring to bear on our work, right? To get uh, to get a more right answer and a less wrong answer. And I guess this is some one of my feminist mentors taught me this. We don't really ever get it right, but we try to get it less wrong. That's a laudable goal, right? We're always trying to get things less wrong. And that kind of point of view can account for the fact that we all stand somewhere and we all bring certain experiences to bear on the work that we do. I would say stop stigmatizing bias and rather learn to understand that we all stand somewhere. And let's sort of try to take account for that in a more productive, healthy way, in a less stigmatizing way, right? Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, we are at time. Thank you so much, Kim. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Those of you who tuned in, tell all your friends to sign up so they can watch it later on YouTube and uh, take good care and we'll see you later. Thanks again. This has been fantastic. Thank you.